Once the Environmental and Social Risk Management System, or ESMS, is designed, it's still important to make sure it will be integrated into the existing credit cycle. How exactly does it work? First of all, during the loan application phase, the extent and nature of the transaction must be identified in order to establish a first categorization of the risk level. Of course. We'll have to take into account our exclusion list, right? Absolutely. After this first screening phase comes the proper risks analysis called due diligence. The due diligence is a step-by-step -step approach performed with the help of checklists and questionnaires, but also in some cases on-site visits. The verifications will be proportionate to the level of risk, hence the preliminary categorization. On-site visits are usually reserved for projects that have been identified with high potential risks. Regarding the loan agreement itself, what elements should it contain? The environmental and social requirements that resulted from the due diligence must be included in the loan agreement. But more specifically? In practical terms, the loan agreement must include first, the action plan that was agreed with the client and which lists the actions necessary to meet the requirements. Second, some legal covenants which must include clear provisions for addressing non-compliant situations and clear lines of responsibility between the client and the bank. And third, a non-compliance reporting procedure. Oh yes, the famous environmental and social reporting and its associated non-compliance reporting. Ha! Huh, you know that one already. <laughs> <laughs> now let's talk about the organization and the resources that will be needed to operate your ESMS. Yes, I'm all ears. The implementation and operation of an ESMS relies on qualified staff that is familiar with sustainability issues. At all levels of the hierarchy, I suppose? Indeed, first a representative of the executive board must be assigned to the promotion of the environmental and social policy and programs. That's my role. Perfect. Then a senior risk manager must have the ultimate responsibility for the ENS assessments and recommendations to be made to the credit committee. Under his supervision, an ENS coordinator will be the bank expert on these issues. He will be responsible responsible for the application of the system, will provide assistance for higher risk projects and will monitor and report the environmental and social risks of the global credit portfolio. And they would also be assisted by the sales force, the portfolio managers, credit analysts and the legal department. Correct again. Thank you. Just one more thing. You don't want to let me go. I don't. On a more serious note, the ESMS must, of course, be adjusted to the level of risk related to the client's activity. Actually, the higher the risk, the more extensive the system will be. Exactly. I've prepared a table that summarizes the risks level by type of activity. Hmm. I see that microfinance is very low risk. For SMEs, it varies according to the sector and size of the company. But for corporate lending, I must say that the risks can in some cases be quite high, as the clients are usually much larger companies. In terms of housing, it depends on the type of projects, individual housing or bigger real estate projects, and on the environmental sensitivity of the geographic area. In terms of trade finance, the risks are relatively low, unless the transaction involves a high-risk product such as palm oil or gold. Usually banks apply customized exclusion lists for this type of business. What about bigger projects, like large infrastructure projects? Is the risk seen as high? And for Tier 2 banks that lend their money to other financial institutions? It's the same thing. If you're truly as experienced as you sound, following your advice can do us nothing but good.